Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, no? Yes, can you hear me better now? Okay, that's, that's set for your site. <laughs> okay, welcome. Welcome, everyone. I'm really so uh, happy to um, welcome you to this particular talk today from uh, Tania Mitchell. Uh, how does the sound, is the sound working or not working? It's a little iffy. Okay, let's, let's do a little sound check before we get started. I think, is the other one working or? Mic check. I can. Beautiful. Take two. So I just want to welcome everyone out here today coming out for uh, this really special presentation uh, by Tania Mitchell. And uh, today, as many of you in the audience know, is our Trucken Conference, which is the Research University Civic Engagement Network. And uh, when we were beginning to organize for that conference, uh, wanting to have a keynote for, for that particular conference, and when in conversations with Tania that she agreed to be here, I also realized that it was a great opportunity to kind of share her voice and her wisdom with a lot of people. So this is a public event, so we also uh, advertised it as well. And it is being live streamed and it will be recorded. So uh, folks will have an opportunity to kind of look back at it and, uh, and see it once again. So uh, I'm just gonna do a really brief introduction to Tania because I know everyone is, is, would really is excited and interested to hear her. Uh, speak today. And so uh, Tania D. Mitchell is an Associate Professor of Higher Education in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota. Her teaching emphasizes college students and their development, issues of equity and access, leadership and policy and practice in the functional areas of student-facing units in institutions of higher education. Her research focuses on the experience of minoritized students in higher education and service learning as a critical pedagogy to explore civic identity, social justice, student learning and development, race and racism, and community practice. She interrogates practices in higher education that aim to contribute to a more just world. And in the Truckin um, program, there's a really much longer bio which talks about all of her awards and uh, many accolades that she has received. I'm just really so thankful and uh, it's so wonderful to, in a sense, welcome Tania back. I always feel when she's visited, I think the last time you were at UMass, it might have been 10 years ago, I think. But, and for another conference uh, that was happening on campus around um, valuing engaged scholarship. But uh, so having Tania be here today, it feels like a little bit of a homecoming since, since Tania did you know, get her uh, graduate degree here and uh, whenever, and we have, she has so great friendships with all of us in the civic engagement and service learning office. So uh, I'll let Tania talk more about what her talk is, which is called, I'll just do the title, Coming into Consciousness, Rethinking Community Engagement in the Wake of Pandemics. So I just would like everyone to give a, a warm round of applause to Tania Mitchell. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm just gonna shout out Anne-Marie Russell because I'm so excited to see you. Oh my goodness. Um, so as Joseph said, this is a little bit of a homecoming for me. Um, I moved away from Amherst 20 years ago next month after, um, yeah, I know Jimena, we're old. 
<laughs> my advisor, my doctoral advisor, Jimena Zuniga, is also here. Um, I, uh, I, was, I was a doctoral student here in the social justice education program and had just finished my comprehensive exams um, when I took a job at Cal State Monterey Bay. Um, and so a month, a month from now, 20 years ago, we moved to California. And so um, I spent how many hours in this room, Art? <laughs> <laughs> in this space, in this building, um, during my graduate program. So it is, it is lovely to be, to be here and to be with you. Um, I'm so grateful to, for this opportunity. I want to express my gratitude to all of the organizers at Truckin, um, to the Department of Civic Engagement and Service Learning, and especially to Dr. Joseph Krzyzewski for this invitation, for the organization of today, and especially for bringing us together. Um, I feel really excited for this opportunity and for the space as well as for your willingness to be here in this moment, either in person or virtually, for those of, us, for the, for those of you joining us via the live stream. I remain appreciative that we've figured out new ways to share space and share thinking in the midst of the pandemic. I want to extend my gratitude to all of you for your generosity in making space to be thoughtful and planful and hopeful about community-engaged praxis and the civic opportunities before us. I am grateful for the space and for this time to think with you about what our work is and should be now as we navigate this current socio-political context. I first started writing about my experiences in this moment in June of 2020, but as the contexts have continued to shift, so is my thinking. And because I have a tendency to ramble, those of you who know me know this is true, um, I'm going to read my remarks, um, but I hope you'll be distracted by um, all the pretty pictures that I'm going to share with you um, this afternoon. My hope is to share some experiences and thinking and to get us thinking together about a community engagement praxis that has had to shift and likely needs to do more shifting in order to be fully immersed in and responsive to what is happening around us. Normally, I would be offering you these insights from my home office in South Minneapolis, which is actually my closet, which is only a few blocks from where George Floyd was murdered on May 25th of 2020. I live three blocks from the intersection of 38th Street and Chicago Avenue in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where Mr. Floyd died. Like most of the world, I found out about his death the next morning as the video of Minneapolis police officers facilitating his restraint and then his death was broadcast on the morning news. At that point in late May of 2020, I hadn't been to the intersection since March. At that point in the coronavirus pandemic, my little daycare was closed, campus was shuttered, I had no need to go to the bus stop on the corner. The restaurant I frequented had not yet reopened, at this point, we were all sheltered in place under Governor Waltz's orders responsive to the coronavirus pandemic. Basically, I hadn't left my house for more than two months. And then Mr. Floyd died. It was shortly after 8 a.m. on the morning of May 26 when I first heard the news of Mr. Floyd's killing, and it was just after 11 o'clock a.m. when I heard the first helicopters. Police, military, and media helicopters would be overhead for much of the month that followed. Sirens, smoke, and cries for justice dominated our census for weeks. But I'm going to take a step back. I'd actually like to ask you to take a second to think about the world and your life on and before May 24th of 2020, when COVID rightly dominated the news, when all of our work was moved remotely, when travel and pretty much any plans with other people were canceled when the death tolls continued to rise and felt like they may never slow, when people were afraid to leave their homes. Kernan argued that racism is a pandemic inside a pandemic. The coronavirus pandemic has highlighted America's enduring racial disparities, which are fueled by decades of unequal treatment, unequal opportunity, and structural barriers. According to Greenhouse, Blacks have been infected with COVID-19 at three times the rate of whites, and their death rate is twice that of whites. The same is true for members of the Latinx community, and the numbers are worse for members of the Native American, of different Native American tribal communities. We still see disparate distribution patterns in the vaccine, with communities of color and those from low-income communities being under-vaccinated. 
Research, recent research has revealed that one in every four COVID deaths leaves a child without their primary caregiver. This number is twice as likely for Latinx children, 2.4 times more likely for black children, and 4.5 times more likely for Native American children. This level of grief feels almost impossible to comprehend. The economic impacts of racism emerge through the pandemic as we see hugely disparate impacts on the finances and prospects of people of color. COVID-19 has exacerbated racial disparities in joblessness throughout the American economy, disproportionately impacting people of color, even as these same folks are more likely classified as essential workers, particularly in high-risk janitorial and sanitation work, as well as in agriculture and food processing, which were significant hotspots early in the pandemic. The end of the federal eviction moratorium meant that blacks and Latinos would lose their housing at much greater rates than whites. And Feeding America, the organization that tracks food insecurity and runs food distribution programs across the country, saw an increase of 46% in people requesting services, meaning more than 42 million people experience food insecurity in the United States. For myriad reasons, we know that minoritized communities will have a harder time rebounding economically from the pandemic. And the structural injustices of racism, everything from disproportionate rates of home ownership to less reliable medical coverage and access, from the everyday fear of police violence to the agonizing burden and grief of losing loved ones. For the last two years and still now, it feels as if we are in the wake of multiple pandemics not just COVID, but also the pandemics of economic inequality and structural ra racism that have us in what Fisher and Bubba call the pandemic inequality feedback loop. In Christina Sharp's text, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, she uses multiple definitions of wake as a way to analyze black survivance. Sharp writes, wakes are processes. Through them, we think about the dead and about our relations to them. They are rituals through which to enact grief and memory. But wakes are also the disturbant, disturbance in the water, the air currents behind a body in flight, a region of undisturbed flow. And wake means being awake and also consciousness. So let's return to 38th in Chicago. The notion of wake as process, as grief, and memory, as tribute and celebration, as disturbance, as awakening, as consciousness. These elements of the wake feel very real at the intersection where George Floyd was killed. It's a weird thing, one that I've never experienced before, to have your neighborhood become a major news story. It's a strange thing to acknowledge that I live in an active and ongoing site of protest. It's been almost 23 months since Mr. Floyd was killed, but the site where he died just three blocks from my home has been sacred space, contested space, but also hallowed. I have a four-year-old, and after George Floyd's death, I was driven by a desire to raise a young person who is aware, but not afraid, of the realities of being a black person in the world. I had a desperate need to find a space to express outrage and grief. I was really wanting the comfort of community, despite COVID. And so I started spending time at the intersection. In those first days after his death in late May and early June of 2020, it was a media hotspot. It was filled with camera crews and reporters, protesters and mourners. And then it changed. Protests continued around the city, around the world, really. In Minneapolis, attention shifted towards downtown and also to the location of the Minneapolis Police Department's third precinct, where the uprising that decimated the Lake Street Corridor, burning down the police precinct, but also a near three-mile stretch of businesses, mostly restaurants and small shops, many of them owned by people of color, as well as grocery stores, a Target, and a few pharmacies. The initial impact of this destru destruction was, of course, painful and scary and the arrival of the National Guard, which followed, changed the tenor of the whole moment. It became a shift from protest to confrontation. But at 38th in Chicago, the site of George Floyd's death, it had really truly been transformed. 
the pandemics of racism, economic inequality, and COVID were already at play in the four neighborhoods that intersect at 38th and Chicago. And those pandemics were felt deeply before George Floyd's death. But the incident at 38th and Chicago demanded a different kind of response and inspired a different kind of engagement. I've been trying to find another space where someone has been killed, especially through state violence, and the site of their death remains memorialized. The only one that I can arrive at is the Lorraine Motel, where Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And the profundity of these two deaths being held as sacred sites, the one who led protests and was killed, and the one whose killing bore protests, has stayed with me as I move through the intersection. George Floyd Square is a powerful place to be. It is one filled with reverence, but also a lot of tension. As the community gathers during the trial of Derek Chauvin, the former police officer who physically restrained Mr. Floyd with his knee on his neck, felt even more palpably and released, at least for a moment, as Chauvin was found guilty a year ago on April 20th of 2021. The tension rebuilt as city officials and some community members insisted that it was time to reopen the intersection. And on Friday, June 4th of 2021, city crews arrived at the intersection at 4.30 a.m., giving no notice to caretakers to remove the barricades and clear the street to allow traffic. People put their bodies before tow trucks and bulldozers that were already undoing what had been built. They put their personal property in the street to recreate the barriers just removed. They were reasserting this space as ours to preserve, to protect, to protest. The trial of Kim Potter, the Brooklyn Park police officer who shot Dante Wright during Derek Chauvin's trial. The federal trial on civil rights violations of the three officers with Chauvin during that fateful day. And in early fe February, just nine seconds after executing a no-knock warrant, Minneapolis police killed Amir Locke. It felt like, it feels like, as Sharp wrote, that we are replaying traumatic events of the past and bracing ourselves still for more injury. All of this, these reminders, these remainders, these reassertions, keep George Floyd's death of front of mind for many of us in Minneapolis. It keeps the memorial, it keeps the protest necessary. The neighbors and the community members who see themselves as committed to a different future, a more just future for those who live in and near the 38th Street Corridor have stepped up in huge ways. Seeing the place where George Floyd was murdered by the state as sacred ground, as a site of protest, as a space to create and sustain black joy, it is important to recognize the artists, activists, and organizers who are doing the everyday labor of beautifying the intersection and maintaining the site as an autonomous zone. This is most visible through the work of Janelle Austin, the lead caretaker who works most closely with the Floyd family and, and art spaces throughout the city to curate and preserve the memorial. Jay Webb is a gardener who designs the landscaping and leads people in planting and cares for the plants, flowers, and vegetables that are installed there. Marsha Howard is our neighbor. She's a teacher who took a leave of absence to dedicate herself to the protest and also a former Marine. She keeps an active Instagram and TikTok presence and has been a visible leader to share the story of the protest. Sanctuary, sacred space. It was renamed by the people, not the city. This is a mock-up of what a park and recreation board could be. Um, George Floyd Square. The intersection remained completely blocked to vehicle traffic and accessible only to walkers, rollers, or bikers for a full year after his death. It is now technically open to traffic, but usually traffic is light. Very few cars choose to drive through the intersection, and when they do, it is often with desire to see this space, the place where George Floyd died, and how the community has remade it. It looks different now than it did last spring because of now being open to traffic, but it is still the square. It's sacred space. When called for, it becomes a place to dance, a space for cultural celebrations, an ice skating rink in the colder months, and a roller rink when it's warmer. It has been an art gallery, a gathering place, a meditation site. It has been a COVID testing location and a vaccination spot. 
It remains a resource center distributing mutual aid, a food pantry, a lending library, a mobile medical clinic. It is a classroom where people come to learn about the community and social movements. It is a community organizing training ground. Last year, when the intersection was still closed to traffic, the city named concerns about what would happen with snow removal, given the barricades and barriers. Those concerns were quickly answered when volunteers showed up with wheelbarrows and shovels to ensure the area was kept clear. Public art, including murals, sculptures, benches, street art, and billboards, are protected. Flowers that are brought to honor and that have begun to wilt or have died are collected and composted. Gardens are planted and watered, weeded and harvested for those who are food insecure. There are caretakers who educate visitors about the space, introducing the art, pointing them to resources, encouraging people to honor the place and remembering what happened, to be reverent, to be encouraged, and to be inspired towards more action. George Floyd Square aims to be an autonomous zone. From May 2020 until June of 2021, the area policed itself, mostly facilitated by volunteers and gatekeepers, named such because they held the barriers at the four corners of the intersection to welcome people to the square. Of course, this is before it was reopened, and the reopening moved, removed the barriers, but five fist sculptures remained to mark the square. Gatekeepers now hold vigil at the People's Way, and people still come. There was limited police presence in the square during the 15 months when the intersection was fully barricaded. Even today, there remains hesitancy both by the police department, the caretakers, and many residents to have police anywhere near the site where George Floyd died and his memorial is kept. Of course, this is complicated and contested. Questions continue to be raised about increased crime in the area. Concerns about those actions are serious and were named by the city as the primary motivation to end the protest and reopen the square to vehicle traffic. Many of us who live near the intersection requested that the city delay the effort to open the square until the trials scheduled for June of this year of former officers Tao, Lane, and King concluded. But this, like many things in community, was not a universally held opinion. Neighbors were frustrated with the continued disruption to traffic patterns and limited access to businesses in the square. Neighbors were frustrated by losing their parking spaces to visitors to the memorial. Neighbors were concerned that in an emergency, no one would come. The city worried about the barriers as a disruption to businesses and ongoing life in the significant, area, in the significant intersection in South Minneapolis. Bus routes interrupted, traffic detoured, challenging access for city and emergency services. It is important though to remember that these barriers that the city wanted to remove were originally put in place by the city to protect the thousands of mourners and protesters who came to visit the intersection immediately after Mr. Floyd was killed. It is important to remember that the elements of the memorial that the city knew it could not move, the fist sculptures at the five space stations, the greenhouse, the actual site of George Floyd's death, which is now covered with flowers and a mural painted on the asphalt that reduces a four lane road into a barely passable two lane road. And it's important to remember that pedestrians still flock to the square each day. And still, the effort before sunrise on a Friday in June to remove those barriers and reopen the intersection. The city though seemed unaware of what George Floyd Square had become and the importance of the space to our city. 38th in Chicago is actually the intersection of four neighborhoods, Central, Powderhorn, Bancroft, and Bryant. Each neighborhood association has been involved in the remaking and reimagining of George Floyd Square and the work to coordinate with the city, but it is the volunteers holding George Floyd Square as a site of protest working to push city leadership to think through what the intersection has been, is now, and should be in the future. It's bizarre and simultaneously inspiring to see a space of so much disruption, violence, and pain transformed into a place of healing where community is deeply felt and practiced. After living in this space, I've been thinking about the place of higher education community engagement in this particular moment. I'm profoundly aware of how much my proximity to George Floyd Square is informing my perspective on these ideas. At the same time, recognizing the pervasiveness of these issues, recognizing them as pandemics, 
I know that mine is not the only community experiencing this level of trauma and navigating this opportunity for healing. I think, of course, about the war in Ukraine and the millions unsettled and displaced, the conflict in Jerusalem between pal Palestinian and Israeli fighters, the asylum seekers at the border. I'm thinking about battles for reproductive rights, the legislative battles further dehumanizing queer and trans people. I'm remembering the violence outside of Atlanta and across the country targeting Asians and Asian Americans, of the mass shootings in too many places, the climate disasters, those hurricanes, tornadoes, and wildfires, even the insurrection attempt at the Capitol in January of 2021. All of these I'm thinking about as sites of violence and trauma that have reverberating effects in our communities, especially when seeking to reconcile them against COVID and the expanding economic inequities and disparate health impacts we continue to navigate. What do these intersections, both that physical location of 38th in Chicago and the intersection of pandemics, of racism, economic inequality, and COVID-19 teach us about the possibility to create community and engage differently. In 2020, TJ Stewart issued a black feminist critique of higher education's response to COVID and wrote, quote, black feminism at its core is a liberation framework, an emancipatory ethic, and as such instructs that we should all strive to change the material conditions of the marginalized, especially the hyper-marginalized, both in the academy and beyond. So what would black feminism suggest for community engagement in higher education right now? This attention to the hyper-marginalized requires focus on people and communities of color. It means naming the disproportionate impacts of these multiple pandemics on minoritized and hyper-marginalized communities and focusing our efforts on transforming the material conditions that sustain these inequalities. Our community engagement work should be revealing. It should make clear the systemic injustices at play that marginalize the already marginalized. It should focus in on the policies, practices, conditions, and experiences that shape the everyday realities of the poor and people of color. Community engaged work should find ordinary and creative ways to center those stories so that they are seen and heard and understood in new ways. At George Floyd Square, this work of revealing is emerging through works of art and the artist statements that accompany them, through posted notices where statistics wave beside personal testimonies from people in the community, through information signs at each station that explain why the station is, is useful, important, and necessary to the community members who are here. It is present in the reports to city leaders that are advocating for official recognition of the intersection as a city park and the grant applications seeking funding to continue the development work neighborhood volunteers have shepherded and sustained. Shifting our community engagement practice in the wake of pandemics and in ways reflected in the efforts at George Floyd Square means building and maintaining relationships with BIPOC-led organizations where those folks are working and living in the communities where their work is centered. And George Floyd Square has shown that those organizations don't always need to be formally recognized 501c3s, but that passionate and committed leaders who understand the unique and diverse needs of our community are important to partner with as well. Our work needs to better match the priorities of the community members we purport to serve. Stewart wrote, the impact of oppression on minoritized people is violent, magnified, depending on the number of minoritized identities you have and informs the context that you exist in. In order to understand those impacts and do work that remedies rather than exacerbates them, we need to hear what those community members are seeking in order to move closer to their own liberation. Too often, our actions in community are dictated by organizations in place for generations, but with little staff or investment from the community. Work done to or for instead of work done with or done by. Our community engaged work should be responsive. Black feminism insists on taking the space and opportunity for those most impacted to build a politics responsive to their lives and experiences that will make the everyday change lives and ultimately bring forth the end of their oppression. 
At George Floyd Square, community needs assessments drive the work that happen at the intersection. Caretakers regularly engage visitors to the site to best understand what brings them to the memorial. And organizers host meetings with residents to learn what resources would facilitate the improvements they seek for themselves and their community. Answers to these questions drive partners invited to host space at George Floyd Square. The needs of the community and of the square get named at daily community meetings at the People's Way. They inform the 24 demands that George Floyd Square caretakers have assembled and named Justice Resolution 001. These collected and collective understandings drive the work of the day, but also future programming and development opportunities. They facilitate calls to council leaders, to treatment centers, to medical facilities, and others that can provide remediation for the concerns brought to the, to the attention of organizers. George Floyd Square prioritizes those who live in direct proximity to the intersection. It cares about sustaining and creating the conditions for a thriving black community that has often been disregarded. That doesn't mean that black people engaged in the work of holding space and demanding justice are all black. It means that everyone involved in the work of holding space and demanding justice are listening to black people to most fully understand and to determine what it means excuse me, what it means. It is wakefulness as consciousness, which Sharp calls wake work, striving to move us closer to the unfinished project of emancipation. Our community engagement work should seek to repair. These past two years have revealed much about the costs of oppression in our society. The losses, the struggle, the precarity, faced by black, indigenous, and people of color is represented by what Brian Stevenson names as the persistent refusal to view black people as equals. By shaping our community engagement work as reparative, I'm hopeful that we embody a praxis that challenges the skepticism in the possibility of community, that we demonstrate our care by prioritizing the work that the community names as necessary and by sustaining our efforts in the community until the emancipatory aims are met. We frame concerns as, quote, policy failures rather than personal failures, in the words of Andre Perry, in order to work towards system-level responses that may generate needed change. Andre Perry, for example, focuses on questions of the racial wealth gap and looks at practices that undervalue homes owned by people of color as contributors to the discrepancy we see between black and white wealth in the U.S. It is reframing the problem from a concern that black people can't get loans to the systemic issue that banks too frequently refuse to loan money to black people. Gloria Ladson Billings famously reframed the meanings of success and the discrepancy between persistence and school readiness for white students and students of color as an opportunity debt rather than an achievement gap. These reframings but also the work in community that these kinds of understandings require move us toward a reparative community engagement praxis. Santiago Ortiz encourages us to embrace epistemic disobedience and anti-colonial engagements that disrupt hierarchies and prioritize solidarity, quote, working for transformation collectively and interdependently. At George Floyd Square, the focus on healing feels reparative. The work to honor George Floyd's life while advancing calls for police reform, for affordable housing, and investment in business opportunities for people of color feels reparative. Lead caretaker Janelle Austin warns against letting pain be our primary source of energy, and instead prioritizing joy. The centering of art and beauty, of fun and laughter, aim to leverage the capacity for joy, recognizing that joy can be its own form of protest and resistance. The collective organizing and shared labor that guides the work at the memorial site reflects the kind of community leadership that civil rights activist Ella Baker envisioned. It reminds me of Grace Lee Boggs theorizing that hyper-local focused action, like this one intersection in South Minneapolis, can become spaces to practice the just societies we hope to create. It reminds me of the opportunity that is present as Sharp contends for people who are aware of and conscious of their being in the wake, to employ particular ways of re-seeing, re-inhabiting, and reimagining the world. 
I remain hopeful that we move beyond practice to a sustained reality of radical change rooted in justice. And while I think the way forward for our community engaged practice can be, in, can be guided by this framework of reveal, respond, and repair, I realize that this example of George Floyd Square is not one that represents or partners with higher education community engagement. I know some of us from the University of Minnesota and other local colleges are involved in different ways at the intersection, but none of it that I am aware of, yet Laurel might be able to correct me, um, is formalized community engagement work in the sense that most of us in higher education would recognize it. The work to remake and reimagine the community requires hands-on effort and active participation at the site. People are sweeping. Other people are collecting money to support the ongoing effort. Donated items for mutual aid, works of art, letters to the Floyd family, and offerings to honor George Floyd all need to be cataloged and organized. People are distributing items to community members in need, distributing information about the justice demands for a thriving 38th Street corridor, and giving directions to the various installations in the square. People are painting new art, covering graffiti, and beautifying the square. People are greeting visitors daily and even hosting media as interest in George Floyd Square persists. All of these activities are about honoring the freedom dreams, as Robin Kelly calls it, and the hopes for justice that bring people to George Floyd Square. It is about inspiring the possibilities for greater justice and bringing us closer to realizing it. Janelle Austin insists that building stronger communities is rooted in the decision we make to be a neighbor. What does it mean to recenter the focus of partnership from nonprofits to neighbors and to move this work of spaces of mutual aid and community building where needs and work shift day to day, where the consistent activity that it so typically guides community engagement placements in higher education is left flexible and unpredictable? How is higher education community engagement transformed when we see ourselves and the institutions we work with as neighbors? How do our decisions shift how does our work change when we position our work with a desire to be good neighbors who are building good relationships with the people in the communities where we are? Mariam Kaba, the prison abolition activist who wrote the 2021 book, We Do This Till We Free Us, asks, when something cannot be fixed, the question is, what do we do instead? George Floyd Square to me is the instead. It embodies organizing. It recognizes immediate need and long-term hope. It engages neighbors. It inspires joy. It embodies a belief that a different future is necessary and that a different future is possible. It reflects the wake work Sharp reminds us is necessary to bring forward new consciousness. Following George Floyd's death in May of 2020, many higher education leaders affirmed their commitments to racial justice and racial equity through much publicized and widely disseminated statements. Community engagement as an institutional strategy for teaching, learning, research, and impact is poised as an intervention where higher education can make that commitment to racial justice and equity visible and tangible. This is a moment for higher education to consider how to reveal, to respond, and to repair the disparate impacts of COVID-19, but also of structural racism and economic inequality. I am hopeful that the commitments many higher education institution leaders made in the wake of George Floyd's death result in actions of accountability for the ways that institutions contributed to the ongoing harms of structural racism. I am conscious of being in the wake of multiple pandemics and want us to use the consciousness of this moment that has been awakened to do the wake work as Sharp encourages to imagine otherwise from what we know now. That work is ongoing. That work is urgent. That work is necessary. And most importantly, that work is ours. Thank you. So Joseph, if I remember correctly, we have some time for questions.
Testing, is that working? Okay. Any questions out there? Hello. Hi. Um, I have kind of a curiosity question, but um, just as someone who lives three blocks away and is a community member, I'm I'm curious kind of like what your daily engagement and interaction with this space outside of kind of seeing it as an, you know, the optimistic future potential model that you just mentioned are. Like, what is it like to engage with this community and be part of it mm -hmm. in this time? Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm, I, I,
the, the, the piece that has felt um, really important to the Floyd family is that there is no return to normal for this space. And I think that is what continues to inspire those caretakers who hold, that, who hold the square, right? Who feel like it's important that we still meet every morning at People's Way, who feel like it's important that you know, those names get repainted or that the murals get kept up um, are really trying to center and honor that place of, of not letting this return to normal. And it's interesting to think about the ways that city leaders hear that and also don't, <laughs> for lack of better language. Um, you know, there's, there is, you know, the, our mayor has said very clearly, like, there are elements, there are elements here that can never go back. We can never let vehicle traffic pass over this space where George Floyd killed, was killed, right? So that's a full lane of Chicago Avenue that, that has to be preserved and protected. And so how do we then create space for a giant city bus to come down this road, um, which is what we also want to see happen, right? And so, so there's this tension of trying to figure out um, how we do both, how we, how we preserve the memory and, and um, also create that, that uh, those traffic patterns that create the economic opportunities in the intersection that people feel like are missing. Tania, it's so wonderful having you here, and thank, thank you, you so much for your presentation. I was wondering, given also your response right now is, so what role does the university, your university, play or consider or sort of think about in relationship to the space and the organizing that's happening? Even like that question of the road and, and yeah. um, its sacredness in some ways. So what's been the university's response? How are faculty or students or staff participating? How are you integrating this um, knowledge building and community building mm -hmm. into your own sort of courses or engagement with students? Mm -hmm. And as well, how, how is, how, mm -hmm. you know, what's, what's the relationship and what's mm -hmm. going on with that? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll speak about it from my perspective and I seriously, Laurel, if you have more information, I would encourage you to help me with this too. Um, so one piece that I think has been true for most of the, in most of the higher education institutions in Minneapolis in particular, um, is that like institutions of higher education all over the world, um, that they have really internalized this opportunity as a moment to look at what's happening on campus and much less what's happening in the community. So, you know, they're what, like 36, 62, <laughs> I forget the number some days, um, institutions of higher education in the greater Twin Cities area, metro area. Like there's a lot of schools um, in the area, probably not 62. <laughs> but, um, but there's, um, you know, but there, they, there is, there's been a lot, you know, we had, we, our president issued one of those statements too about like how it's our opportunity and our moment to consider the mo this moment now and respond in terms of racial justice, right? We now have a George Floyd scholarship um, that provides students with, uh, that provides students with, with free tuition um, at the university, or, you know, as, like, as, part, of, as part of the response. Um, there's been um, a more concerted effort to, to think about our internal practices, particularly with regard to policing on our campus, right? But what does that mean for 38th in Chicago, right? Um, 38th in Chicago is about seven miles from campus. Um, and, so, uh, and so it's not far away, but it's not next door either. But there are a number of partnerships um, between the university and organizations and agencies that are within that, the, particularly within, within the arts corridor that is Chicago Avenue. Um, like Pillsbury United Communities at 35th in Chicago, right? Not too far away. <laughs> um, um, and other spaces, other spaces in the area. Um, but the, the, in, my, in, my, in my interactions, I think the only um, partnership that I know of is happening kind of, what I, I guess I would call it external to the square as opposed to direct engagements with those community members who are doing 
who are doing that everyday work of holding space. So, um, so I know we have a, um, a Mellon Just Futures grant that was offered to our campus that has um, a program called Minnesota Transform. Um, and I know that they have been doing some work in partnership with a number of communities, but also with the George Floyd Global Memorial and particularly around the art spaces um, and uh, doing some work around oral histories of people's experiences with um, this moment in terms of the uprising, um, the protests that followed and others like that. But it, that the, ways that the ways that I am personally seeing that operate is again, not with people directly at 38th and Chicago. Like I'm not seeing people, I'm not seeing people show up to the people's way, the, the ways that I anticipated, I guess I would say. Um, but I also recognize, especially now because of the reopening, that that's a little bit more difficult to put in place, right? Like, um, like we have to keep people from not, get, we have to make sure that people don't get hit by cars. <laughs> um, uh, you know, traffic is, traffic is infrequent, but when, they, when it does come, it's, it's people who, who are oftentimes gawking and so aren't very careful. So we've definitely had some accidents. We have, uh, we have a couple of buses, uh, school buses, that come through the intersection every day because they think it's important to remind their students Right, that this is a space to go. But you, the roundabout that they've created around that fist sculpture um, that you know, is, has, uh, is in the pictures that I shared in this one here, the roundabout that they've created around that, like a, a school bus actually can't maneuver around it safely. Um, and so like the school buses drive up over the curbs <laughs> and do some other things. It's not always, the, it's not always a, a, a safe place for pedestrians. We have to be very, very um, aware of what's happening um, in in the square when you're when you're there in those moments, and so um, so you know, but like the I guess it was two weeks ago, um, uh, a class from Augsburg, um, which is another university in um, in the Twin Cities area, had uh, they had they had a, a class session that they were holding at the square, and so they had all brought out folding chairs, and they were sitting at the People's Way, and they were.